I'm a feminist, but during lockdown, I turned down an invitation to a feminist online event on the basis that I was already booked for another feminist online event, but in fact, I was in the bath watching Say Yes to the Dress Lancashire. <laughs> it's a really good one if you've not watched it. So, I just love Say Yes to the Dress. Have you ever watched Say Yes to the Dress? No, but I'm going to watch in the bath now. I'm not a reality person at all. I'm not a reality... I don't... I'm just... So many of my friends are on WhatsApp groups and like, oh, Love Island or whatever. And I just... It's just not me. I don't do it. I don't... But Say Yes to the Dress, it, all it is is fixed rig cameras in a bridal shop. And it, all it is is women choosing bridal gowns. Now, why is that of interest to me? Do you know what? That was self-care. Well, this is how, what I, certainly what I told myself. Yes, that was self-care. Saying no to a feminist event online in favour of that, I applaud that decision. I, 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 I found lockdown very, very... Because I'm a person that gets my energy from other people. I found having to get my own energy. And Zoom doesn't give it to you. Zoom saps more energy. Yeah. Because you've got to... You know, people are really on board for that. Uh, it saps... It's not the normal, just we're in a room together having fun. or even. It just doesn't do it for me at all. So I just thought, I just don't have it... Because you can't talk over each other on Zoom. No, and that's our favourite thing. So it just, it's just, aw it was just awful. And I just didn't have, I couldn't get it up for the feminist event. So, but I thought, I can't say I'm watching Say Yes to the Dress Lancashire. Even though if they watched it, I think they would understand that I could say that. But it just didn't seem like that was the right excuse. I'm just giggling at, um, I couldn't get it up for the feminist event. <laughs> Sorry. I couldn't, I couldn't do it. You do one. <clears throat> I'm a feminist, but... I'm really delighted that the food poisoning I had this week has shifted some weight. <gasps> I'm honest. No, this is what this section is for. It's what it's for. It's what it's, it's for. It's what it's for. I would also be pleased. I was just, the gasp was that you, go, you were admitting it. Yeah. It is, because I went on the Marina I'm a feminist, coil. but I would never admit that, how, no matter how true it was. Um, this, this dress wasn't, didn't fit me in August. Um, because it, and also in January, I went on the Morena coil, which makes you put on quite, well, made me put on quite a lot of weight, although it's worth it. It doesn't matter. You make your own choices. Um, takes a lot of adjustment. That's a different matter. And uh, yeah, and now I feel like, whew. I mean, it, I'm not suggesting you eat rotten food, but it's just a method that worked for me. <laughs> All weights are great weights. I've been all of the weights, and I've been happy and unhappy at all of the weights. However, we've been raised on patriarchy, and it's okay. I will say, I'm going to be really honest here and say, yeah. I've got a wardrobe full of clothes I love. Mm. And when I put on weight, they don't fit me. And I don't want to buy new clothes. I already spend too much time on Vinted. And <laughs> I genuinely, genuinely think that for me weight loss is all about being able to wear my wear clothes, the clothes again. that you love yeah. yeah I understand that I do understand my that. clothes are my friends I understand and that. I miss them on holiday I, I, I went on holiday that. without my kids and I miss my coat <laughs> um I'm a feminist I'm a feminist but when a bride on say yes to the dress Texas said that she was worried because she didn't think she was going to be able to find a dress that fit her upper chest and then upper region because she could not bring herself to say the word breasts. I laughed out loud. <laughs> I was just, I absolutely laughed out loud. And then, the, you know the guy on Say Yes to the Dress, if you watch it, you'll know him. There's a sort of, um, a sort of camp man on Say Yes to the Dress who goes hunting for the dresses. So the shop assistant will come and say, you know, I'm sure that's not what they call couturier or whatever, will come backstage and they'll say, um, she's looking for this. And there's a camp man who's fabulous who'll say, okay, let me go. And he said, mm, she's going to be very limited in her options because she's a double D cup because wedding dresses come in a B cup and very few designers will open the cup, which is apparently a technical term, or raise the neckline. And I felt so outraged as a D cup woman that I thought there needs to be a campaign. <laughs> I have never felt more white feminist in my life than my outrage at how apparently most... I cannot believe this is true. 
So I am a B cup, and I've never ever considered my bigger boob sisters in this dilemma. Yes. So what do they cut it open and then just put on a patch? I guess so. But he said a lot of designers won't do it in a wedding gown, and I thought, well, that's fucking ridiculous because people want to get married despite the size of their breasts. <laughs> all all breasted size. People want to get burnt. Is that why burnt. sometimes you see like women in a wedding dress and they're really spilling over? Yes. <gasps> because they're a D cup in a B cup. Yeah. Storm in a D cup. We should do we should do a podcast D cup in a B cup. I'd never get it the right I'm way around. A, I'm a D, but for the size of my body, because I'm very tall and broad, it's, just, it's not actually a very big breast. It's just it's just a handful. Mm, mine's a, do you know I'm just enjoying being able to touch my boob in front of an audience. It's so comforting. <laughs> Why are men? Why are men sort of allowed to sort of rummage around in there? We can't just casually at work just <sighs> do that. It's true. Men do sometimes just put their hand on their cock, don't they? Feels just, nice. Yeah, I find it odd though, and I wish they wouldn't. Is anyone finding that? Actually, I feel a bit odd now doing that. I'll stop that. I, I don't. I don't. I would like. I don't. I've never been bothered about having bigger tits. Actually, no, I've, 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 I've had. I've, I've always had, thought they're perfect. They're fine. They're, they're perfectly good. Example of the genre. You do one. Okay. <clears throat> oh, this might be another mean one. I'm a feminist, but whenever Beyonce's Run the World comes on, I have to make the point to someone nearby. You know it was written by three men. Oh, is it? Yeah. I was it? I that's ruined. Look. Well, that's ruined it for me. I had a look. But, it's, it's, it, but of course it was. Who Run the World Girls. Yeah. You yeah. know it was. Because a woman would write women. Yeah. It, it wouldn't scan as well, obviously, but it would ruin the song. I see that. And then that. It, there's a lyric goes, strong enough to have the babies, then get back to business. Like, that's what women do. They just shit out a baby. And they get back get to business. Back and to business presumably means sex because it was written, oh, fuck off. <laughs> have the baby and get back to business. Oh, no, now you've ruined it for me. I just assumed that meant work. No, no. Even if it did, it's not for men to tell us to get back to fucking work. But oh. it sounds to me like get back to sex. No, I hate that song now. It's over. <laughs> Take that off our preset playlist. Our preset playlist wasn't on here tonight. I thought, I thought I'd listen to that. So I, I think that's some quite full on hip hop that we've got there. No, I heard it on the preset. Um, it was on our preset. Yeah. yeah, yeah. I text my friend because there was no one else in the yeah. dressing room saying three men wrote that. Yeah. <laughs> I, no, I, so that's, off my, that's off my playlist now. Uh, I'm a feminist, but tonight somebody sent me a text and it said, uh, at the opening of the Vagina Museum, actually now at the opening of the Vagina Museum, <laughs> now I've read that out loud, it sounds a bit wrong. At the opening of the Vagina <laughs> Museum tonight, and I wouldn't have been here if I hadn't met Florence at The Guilty Feminist. It's a podcast, but it changes lives, and I mean that. Kiss, kiss, kiss. And I thought, I wasn't invited to the opening of the Vagina Museum. <laughs> That was my first thought. My friend sent me this lovely thing. Your podcast changes lives. And I was like, where was my fucking invitation to the <laughs> opening of the Vagina Music? And I was like, well, I've got a show anyway, but I wasn't invited. And she was like, no, 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 no. I'm only here because blah, 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 because I was chatting and da, 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 da. And, and I was like, no, no, no. I'm not genuinely upset. But it was my instinctive response. Everyone should go to the Vagina Museum. Florence and the Vagina Museum, all amazing. They probably thought that, oh, she wouldn't want to come. That she'll be too busy going to, like, the really big vagina museum that's opened up in New York. They probably saw online I was doing a show here, and they probably... Yeah, they checked, because people do check I whether check, yeah. or not guests are That's available. right. They, they don't invite you to a party if they can see that you're... They just go, has anyone heard of Deborah's Free? That Anyway, maybe I got an invitation I didn't see. You know, it was a great um, opening. It's a shame you weren't there. I wondered why you weren't. <laughs> oh, my God. Did you come straight from the opening of a vagina? <laughs> yeah, baby. I, I can't be bawdy. That was me trying to be bawdy. Just um, what, being Austin Powers? Yeah. Okay, all right. Have you got a final one? Yes, my final one is, <clears throat> I'm a feminist, but sometimes I think whether or not I was wrong not to date that multi-millionaire guy I met who said, I just want to look after you. <laughs> Just because I didn't think we were compatible. I rarely go out with someone with a job. Mm. And <laughs> my last partner was the first partner I've ever had, like, since 
for like the last sort of, I don't know, 15 years that aren't the same as me. Mm. And I've always had boyfriends who, um, or girlfriends, um, that, that kind of, I have to pay for everything. I have to pay for dinner. Mm. I have to pay for bus fare mm. sometimes. Mm. Now, I call that feminism, but some people call it control. <laughs> I think it's control. My the brother thing about called it marrying control. a multimillionaire, if he's got enough millions, mm. is he can afford a big enough house that you don't have to see him? You know what I mean? You could, be, you could have a different wing. You could say, yes, I, you could look after me. The way I like to be looked after is I want my own place because I, I, I find it more romantic. Or to keep it as it is and you live in... Um, I live in London and you live in the Scottish Highlands. I like the idea of living separately from a spouse. But that's quite a long way. How, is that, how are they your spouse if you never see them? I don't know. I just know that that would work for me. <laughs> well, in that case... I'm currently in a very important relationship with Brad Pitt. <laughs> we've, we've decided to see other people. Um, that's, tr that's a fact. He and I have both decided to see other people. He just doesn't know about it. Um, Live from Soho Theatre in London, the Spontaneity Shop presents The Guilty Feminist with me, Deborah Francis White, guest co-host Shafarak Sandy, and our very special guest, Leila Navabi, talking about choosing your own adventure. Hello, 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 Soho Theatre is so lovely. Thank you so much for coming out on Saturday night to do feminism. Not like those, not like this fair weather feminists who are like Monday to Friday nine to five feminists, but Saturday night they're off in a some kind of grimy nightclub, writhing and forgetting about feminism. Not that writhing isn't feminist. Writhing can be feminist under the right circumstances. Oh God, I've, I've writhe shamed people now already, already. If you don't know what this is, it's a feminist podcast, but it sounds. It, not as fun as it is. It's way more fun than that sounds. Feminist podcast doesn't sound fun. I give you that. But this is fun. Uh, if you've been before, give us a cheer. <laughs> See, they've come back. That's how fun it is. If you've never come before, but you've always wanted to come, give us a cheer. <laughs> Why? See, they wanted to come because they listen and they know how fun it is. If you still don't believe how fun it is, give us a cheer. Just one person. It's like, well, I'm not convinced... I'm not convinced. Earlier in the week, I had COVID, and so we had to cancel a couple of shows. So whether I scared people away by saying I had COVID earlier, but if I had COVID earlier, I'm the safest person in the world right now because I've just had it. So if there's anyone you should lick, it's me. <laughs> right now. I mean, don't lick anyone, ideally, unless you've come with someone you already lick on a regular basis. Just should give us a cheer if you're here with someone you lick. <laughs> Excellent. Interesting. I did see some couples where one of the couples cheered and the other didn't. So I was thinking that's interesting. And feminists, these things should be reciprocal unless you don't want them to be. Hashtag do what you like. Don't let me influence your licking situation in any way, shape or form. But if you're doing more licking than is being done to you and you want to fix that, you've come to the right place. <laughs> When we do shows at Soho Theatre, we tend to keep them funny and light because we have done heavier ones here before. Everyone, everyone who listens regularly knows that sometimes they are very funny throughout. Sometimes they're funny at the top and then we change gears dramatically because we have a guest on. We want to talk about something serious and then we all cry. We laugh a bit with a well-timed joke every now and again and then we go out on some kind of high. But we have a bit in the middle which is very uh, difficult. And obviously the world is absolutely fucked at the moment. So we will be doing some episodes about that but tend not to do them at Soho Theatre because people have come here specifically for a good time as I have read in the complaint emails. So, so tonight, if you've come here for something deeply serious, you have come to the wrong place. Let's give us a cheer if you'd come for something deeply serious. Just one person? Okay, well, listen. Come to... We do shows in other venues, like King's Place, that are more like that. Um, and I did talk to Amnesty today about doing one about Gaza and the whole situation, because it's so terrifying uh, at the moment. The whole world is fucking terrifying, but obviously, especially... Uh, Gaza and that region is just so horrifying. So we are going to do that with Amnesty. So if anyone's come along and thinking, why are they talking about light and fluffy things and fun things that are kind of, you know, that's why. Uh, it's a Saturday night. It's 9.30. People have had a drink. It's London. Who am I kidding? People have had seven drinks. And... <laughs> 
um, in, in, it's, it's, it's not really the time, but we are going to do a big show on that, either with a live stream or in a venue where we specifically advertise that's what we're doing. The world is horrible at the moment, and it's difficult if you are somebody who cares and gives a fuck. And obviously, you all are, because you've come here tonight. Uh, so thank you for doing that. And we hope that this show restores you a bit with joy and fun, um, because once um, it was the head of Amnesty in Turkey, and she got arrested when Erdogan took over and had some horrible times. And she said to me um, that the three things you need to do is resist. She said, you have to resist all forms of injustice and show the government you're resisting. And she, then she said, you have to be resilient because they're always looking out the window to see, ah, there were a million people at that march and then only 500,000, then only 50,000. So if they can tire us out, they will. And she said, the third one is joy. And she said, most organizations leave that out because they think we don't have time or it's not appropriate. But she said, joy builds resilience and... It also draws more people to your movement. And so tonight, we're going to do some joy to restore ourselves and to build our resilience and to have some fun so that we can continue during the week to try and do whatever small things we can to uh, fight the worst things that are going on in the world. Are you with me on a bit of joy restoration? <laughs> Great. Um, so let's start off by asking this audience, uh, who thinks they've got a feminist job? One, two, three. I know there's more people than that <laughs> because I know my audience are always broken into three sorts of people. Um, one, people who are doing some kind of uh, feminist job that's directly, you know, working with disenfranchised people. Uh, two, people who are in a, like, NHS role or climate change. Uh, or three, people who are doing a PhD about Virginia Woolf. <laughs> um, just give us a cheer if you're doing a PhD about Virginia Woolf. Just to give us a cheer if you're doing a PhD. Yeah, of course. Uh, what's your, what is your PhD on? LGBTQ Of course it is. There we are. <laughs> LGBTQ plus rights. Thank you. What's the name of your PhD? Because it's never on that. It's always the head of a needle. It's a PhD, the whole point of it is you were hitting the narrowest possible target. So could you tell us the, the title of your dissertation? The Democratic Case for Judicial Review of LGBTQ Rights. Okay, one second. The Democratic Case for Judicial Review for LGBTQ Rights. Judicial review means? How courts review legislation. How courts review legislation. So you want LGBTQ rights judicially reviewed and made better, presumably. Otherwise, you're in the wrong show. <laughs> you don't want them taken away. You want more rights for LGBTQ plus people. And you are, where are you doing the PhD? Oxford. Oxford. <laughs> Fancy. So is it in fact then a DPhil? Yes. I knew that. Do I have a PhD? No. Am I going to do one? No. Did I know what Oxford it's called a DPhil? Yes. <laughs> so I think we know who the clever one is here. Um, well, maybe you can come on and tell us about that when you're ready. Tell us how your PhD ends. I hope it's kind of like a twist ending, but a really good one. Really, really hope that. How, how far in are you? I just started out. You've just started out, so you may or may not finish it. I just, I've just met a lot of people doing PhDs. Not all of them hit the finish line. It takes like seven years or something, doesn't it? Seven. It should be three. Well, no one I've ever met has done it in three. If you do it in three, we're going to do a whole own show for you here. We'll advertise it as the three-year PhD show. <laughs> Except it won't be a PhD, will it? It will be a D. Phil. Thank you very much. That's the part you learned from me. Everything else you're going to learn from. What's your name? Sarah. Sarah from Sarah. Excellent. Um, anyone else got a PhD? Give us a cheer. Yay! <laughs> I bet Jimmy Carr doesn't have one fucking PhD in his whole audience. <laughs> I, all, I ha always have a minimum of three, but usually more like around the 12 mark. Not to say you're letting the side down, but you are a Saturday night 9.30 audience, <laughs> let's be honest. Um, what's your PhD in? What's your name? My name is Özgün. And what's your PhD in? Accessibility and inclusiveness of early childhood education and care in the EU. Of course it is. Of course it is. Uh, what's the main discovery that you made? Or can you not ask someone with a PhD that? You can't, she's laughing hollowly like, you're asking a doctor of philosophy to give you a sound bite. I'll give you a sound book. Well, unfortunately, something that's lacking in the UK as far as I um, learned Basically, in the countries that um, put more money in social rights, the accessibility and inclusiveness of uh, childcare. 
are better. So Sweden's better than Britain. I don't have a PhD. But uh, every single time I open the internet, there is a, an article that says uh, uh, free childcare given out with every piece of health care uh, in a free house built sustainably entirely of solar panels mandatory in Sweden but only if the father's a proper father which he's incentivized to be because we throw money at his head every time he picks his own baby up and it's always next to a headline that says Suella Breverman says something and so I had read between those lines but I'm glad that you've proven it to how long did it take you to prove it? Give me a number. Five and a half. Five and a half years! Thank you very much. Thank you very much. We're looking for that three-year PhD over there. Um, anybody think they've got an unfeminist job? Give us a cheer. Yeah. Uh, what's your... You went like that, so like a town crier. Is that the job you have? What's your job? Consulting. Consulting. Um, what do you consult on? Why is it unfeminist? male-dominated industry, but you being in it could be seen as an act of feminism. Do you do any stealth feminism or Trojan horse feminism in your unfeminist job? You do do. What do you do? So I created a well-being series for partners. Created a well-being series for partners. I made them listen to a lecture about menopause. You made them listen to a lecture about menopause. Thank you very much. This is the thing that I've discovered in my audience. Everyone who says that they have an unfeminist job is doing stealth Trojan horse feminism in that job. And in some ways, being more feminist because they're taking feminists to a region that really needs it, like consulting, or in some cases, worse. There was one woman who basically told us that she was doing... She said, I make rich men richer um, with some kind of money investment stuff. And I said, do you do any stealth feminists? She said, oh, yeah. She said, all the time. She said, I tell them to invest in things that I know will not get a great return, but they're really feminist causes. And I said, I said, are you embezzling? And she was like, a bit, yeah, a bit. I'm embezzling a bit, but not enough to go to jail. And then I said, I said, are you, is it not enough to go to jail? And she thought about it and said, I'm not really sure, actually. I mean, I'm in favour of it. And if some of us have to go to jail to further the cause, the suffragettes did it. Who are we not to embezzle very rich men's money? We're at a different time in history. We have the vote. What we also have is a boatload of billionaires. All right, are we ready to start the show? Uh, then please, welcome to the stage, my co-pilot for this evening. She's an extraordinary comedian. Uh, she was a comedian that I idolised. It sounds wrong. It sounds now like I've got her in a box. Uh, that I looked up to when I started stand-up comedy. She's a phenomenal voice. Um, she also does a lot of stuff for, for Amnesty with me. Put your hands together and make incredible woohooing noises for the wonderful Shabrak Kosandi! <laughs> hello, darling. Hello, hello, Deborah. Hello, everybody else. Oh, Shabrak, it's so lovely to have you here. Very nice to be here. Really nice to be here. I've been out for ages. Out the house? Yeah, I took a bit of a break. It's a bit of a break. What, from stand-up or just life? From stand-up um, and, yeah, just a little of a breather. Yeah, I've taken a bit of a break from stand-up. I decided today amazing. I need three months to a year off because I think it's years long. I think right. I take a couple of days off or an afternoon off or an, a day off and I think, oh, I feel so tired now because I've... And I think I need three months to a year off. That's obviously impossible. No one will stand for it. But a little bit of me thinks I should just hibernate for three months. I think after that I would be bored even if I'm Do you mean off from stand-up or any work? I think I should just go to a yurt in the countryside <laughs> and just disappear and pull the shutters down for three months. Wow. I think I've been overworked for years and I think I'm on the cusp of burnout. I'm really well, sorry. Well, no, we, we spoke well, on the People are cheering phone. for burnout there. You're like, go, oh, burnout! Um, are you cheering because you also no. have burnout? Yeah, okay. Well, the thing is about burnout is that us women, we are praised for being busy, aren't we? We're like, oh my God, she's amazing. She's doing it all. If you want something done, ask a busy woman. It's like, no, you're running her into the ground. I can't take proper breaks. I wait till I'm ill. That is my all oh, great. I'm ill, I can stay in bed. 
It happened this week, had terrible food poisoning. It was amazing. <laughs> so restful. I read so much. We are so fucked up that we go, is there any chance that you thought that prawn looks a bit off? Give it to me. <laughs> just, I need an excuse. Because you could have just said you had food poisoning. Do you know what? Sometimes I think I am quite cavalier with my health when I think that, oh, I need a holiday. No, I'll just eat a rotten prawn. Yeah. <laughs> You could just say you'd eaten the rotten prawn, though. I mean, your kids would know, but you could just actually... They wouldn't. you just go into the loo and go... <laughs> like a sheep. <laughs> They'd be like, I turned into a sheep, children. They'd be, like, <laughs> they'd be like, Mummy, why are you doing a sheep impression in the bathroom? And you could say, no, no, this is me vomiting. You have to go and make yourself breakfast. Well, my daughter was so... Because I never get ill, and she was so freaked out by my vomiting. She was like, Mummy, I really think you should call an ambulance. I was like, oh. I'm just being sick. She got quite freaked out. And in a really weird way, I was so happy that they were worried about me for a change. That is nice, though. That is nice. It is nice. Because people, you know, children... I remember when my mother was sick when I was a child, and I used to think... I'm obviously... I was very adored to my mother in, uh, when I was a child. I mean, I still love my mother, don't get me wrong. But, like, when I was a child, I just thought she was the absolutely everything and I was always very sad if she was sick for her but also there was a little bit of me going well this is inconvenient for me <laughs> because who's going to do all the things and make everything lovely and yeah. apparently the answer was nobody <laughs> so she would just sort of only go to bed if she absolutely couldn't stand up and then I'd be like what do I am I meant to make toast or something now what am I meant to how am, how does this work without her I think her? that's how my oldest uh, son feels because he literally had to make me some toast and he just did it wordlessly. And he cooks. Like, he'll cook the evening meal when I'm well. But making me toast when I'm unwell freaked him out. He's mm. like, where shall I put it on your bed? Because he talks like that now. He's 16. It's really awkward between both of us. Shall I put it on your bed or on the bedside table? I said, like, just, just... And I was milking it a bit again. Just on the, on the bed, dear. Thank you. And he goes, would you be needing anything else? <laughs> Oh, she's like a butler. Yeah, he just turned it's into like this weird butler. Yeah, yeah. I said, no, I'll be fine. And then he just did a little bow and walked backwards <laughs> out of the room. I can see you and your son being very much like Jeeves and Worcester now. You could go into your Jeeves and Worcester era with him where he, he waits on you with a very deep voice and a little bit of judgment. That's the dream, Freud. That's the dream. <laughs> We're going to talk about the dream tonight because um, we, tonight we've decided what we wanted to talk about is the picture in our head that, you know, like, this is nothing to do with body, but in body terms, the body parallel is, you know, where there's the sort of, we've been all raised with this idea of the body on the billboard that we're meant to have. So you've got two options there. Um, work for that body and always be dissatisfied because it's not real. Or fight working for that body mentally and keep going, I'm fine as I am. I love what I have. And that's exhausting too. It's all exhausting. So... Not, we're not talking about bodies, but that's, the I think, an easy way of explaining it. We're talking about our life, and there's a picture that's been drawn for us as to what it's meant to look like and what, it, you know, what rom-coms told us it was, what the, you know, just what society told us it was. And if you don't have it, like married, children, dog, own home, all of that, in any way, shape or form, you're always going, I'm fine being a signal, I'd like it. Yeah. Uh, or... <laughs> Children didn't even want them and don't want them and are annoyed when people... I vote, yes, I've got one child, thanks. Stop asking me if I'm going to have another child. You'll know if I have another child because you'll meet it. Stop asking. Stop asking, Aunt Margaret. No, she's not lonely. She's very socialised. And so whatever you've got is not good enough for the world. And the exhaustion of telling yourself it's fine. And so I, we wanted to spend some time tonight going, is feminism helpful with this? Or is it actually make it even more difficult sometimes because now you've got feminism to leave it up to? So that's what we're talking about. We're talking about the picture. If it's in a way that the picture in our mind and it's sort of like, I guess the theme is choose your own adventure. Yes. Yes. And I, you know what came to my mind um, when someone's got one child? Mm. I now go, oh, you haven't got an only child. You've got a one and only child. <laughs> To spare them, because they yeah. almost prepare themselves for your mm. next question. Like, no, in fact, I wouldn't even have asked the question, because I, I never ask women if they have children, because if a woman has children, mm. in about two and a half minutes, she'll tell you. Yeah, she'll tell you, yeah. So you will have seen Here's, pictures of them by now. 
Here's the thing. Or she I'm, does the, she wants a night off. She doesn't want to fucking talk about them. She doesn't want to be filtered that way. She's out with a glass of champagne in her hand and a posh frock on. And the last thing she wants to talk about is Jeremy. He's driving her up the fucking wall. <laughs> she wants to pretend she doesn't have a child who's driving her crazy. If she's having a nice time with Jeremy, he'll be mentioned. He will. And, and there, there, is, there are your friends and they are your mum friends. And the mum friends, you could be out with them with a glass of champagne, somewhere fancy, and especially in the situation I'm in now with a year six child. And then the conversation is, school, 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 school. And we talk about it like we have a choice. <laughs> like it's not just the school that you can walk to. I'm feeling some recognition in the audience. They'll go, oh, here are all the borough schools you can go and look at. Let's go and choose one. No, it's the one that is closest to your house as the crow flies. Doesn't matter if people get stabbed outside it. Doesn't matter if the head teacher is a crack addict. That's the one you're going to go to. You know what I find really difficult? As I, I thought that all of this stuff, as I get older, would shed. Yeah. But now it's all being happy with things like, have you seen that hashtag, grey hair, don't care? Oh, yeah. And people going, oh, my God, Pamela, and... Um, Anderson went out without any makeup oh, on, no, no, no. and she just had the skin that she spends lots of money rejuvenating. Yeah. And and we're all meant as older women went to go. Okay, I'll let me. I don't want to let my hair grow no, grey because no, I look like the witch entangled before she steals the hair. Right as it is, and I will not grey hair. I'm not doing care. it either. I'm not I'm interested not in it. I'm not interested in it at all. And I listen. Hats off. Or on, if or that's on, what you or want. Or on, or on. For anyone... Listen, I know women who are going grey and they're loving it and I am fully in celebration of that and I think they look beautiful. I don't want it and I don't want to feel less feminist because I go and get highlights done. I've hardly got any grey anyway. I get a little bit here. You can see it now at the moment. It's growing in. So tenacious, isn't it? It's <laughs> you made a face at my grey hair as if you no, were Because I'm furious. thinking of my own, look. Yeah, yeah. yeah. And I get a couple up here, but I'm I've barely... I'm a bit angry with you about it. I've barely got any. And if you have a lot and you go silver, that's kind of cool. But if you've just got a bit, it just looks like, in my case, I, I couldn't be asked. Yeah. It does not look like a political statement on me. None of that works. I've said it before on this. When Sophie Duker lets her hair grow out under her arms, it looks like a political statement. I just look like I've let myself go. Like, I cannot... Nothing of that makes looks like a political statement on me. I'm sorry, hairy legs, nothing. I've tried it all. It just looks like I ran out of time. Okay. It's, I can't believe I'm about to share this. Yeah, go on. But I have this real issue. Right? I read Catelyn Moran's book about women and letting your bush just be a bush, right? Oh, yeah. Now, this, this horrific thing happened to me. I kind of need to be held while I tell you this. Okay. Go on. I'll hold you. <sighs> Go on. I went on a TV show called I'm a Celebrity, Get Me Out of Here. Yes. And I thought, I'm not going to... If you haven't heard of it, it's like when a group of intellectuals sit in a clearing in the forest and they <laughs> discuss philosophy. And I thought, well, I'm not going to be able to, like do my bits and bobs. Mm. So I'll go and get some electrolysis, you know, the mm. permanent hair removal, just because, you know, because I'm from the Middle East. I don't need to explain anything to anyone, right? There's a lot going on to my knees. And the lady <laughs> that did it, she was, she was an assertive person. And next thing I knew, she took the lot off. Oh. And it doesn't come back. Why am I saying this in public? It doesn't come back. So since then, every time I've had a new partner, mm -hmm. I've had to sit them down and explain to them, well, what happened was I was going on I'm a Celebrity and I went to this weird place that only took cash. <laughs> oh, my God. This is like in Sex and the City where S S Carrie Bradshaw gets a wax in LA and says it was a mugging because um, yes. they took it all. But that's all very well if you're, it's a wax. But if it's electrolysis, it's, and even it's never going it. to come back. I can't explain it to so my do, Are you full Barbie? I mean, <laughs> I believe so. And it's, it's really difficult because it's Could not Could you my get heart. a little bit just popped back on? Is there a way? <laughs> what, like, call, um, call a footballer, call Wayne, Wayne what's-the-name and ask where he did his hair transplant. Yeah, it like a little there. bit of... Exactly, like men get hair transplants. Could you get, like, just... No, I'm not bothered by it, but I need to explain to people that that's not my heart. <laughs> so to speak. Shappy and I both have ADHD, so we... When we start talking, we just... We cannot stay on topic. Like, it's in physically impossible. You know you're going to get a text from me later going, can you edit out the pubes bit? 
No, it's too... We won't have any of the show left. Um, <laughs> all right. It, to be honest, it's better because if you fancy a guy, you can just send him this episode and then you don't ever have to have the chat. But it's not even with guys. It's mostly with, like, women. Like, if I, I date a woman... I'm so sorry. I just think... You are bisexual and so am I and I've just heteronormed you. No, that's okay. I'm so sorry. No, it's okay because I've got internalised homophobia so I'm I that's mainly right, that's go right. out I, You with told her. me that this afternoon. And you're, the last partner that I knew was a man, so I just made a leap. And I'm so sorry I heteronormed you. I'm so sorry. Well, ha- happily for you, I wasn't even sure what that word was that you just used, so that's all I've, good. Well, it's sort of like I've just made up a yeah, word no, based no, on I heteronormative. Mean, no, I, yeah, oh, I see. I yeah, don't yeah. think heteronorm is a word, but I'm no. just... It is now. But, um, all right. Yes, I hear what you're saying. I'm currently unmedicated. I only tried the medication for a while. It made me gurn like I was on cocaine. Not that I've ever tried cocaine, but I've seen people on it. And that, you know, when people do that, and I had to have chewing gum at the end of the day, I need a, I'm, I'm going for a lower dose. So I didn't take my medication today because mm. I've had food poisoning. And I, I, I'll be honest, I do feel it. I do feel, feel like I'm not on it, like anything <laughs> might go. And then when we had a chat this afternoon on the, on the phone for hours and hours, and it was, we were worried that it would become showtime and we'd still be on the phone... <laughs> And then you said, we've both got ADHD. I was like, I thought it was just because we've really got on. And that's, that's ADHD hypersensitivity. Oh, darling. No, it is also that. There's people with ADHD I, I can't be raped right to be shot off. I'm like, oh, dear, is that the time? And I hang up. But when you get on with someone with ADHD, it is a particular recipe for endless love and yeah. endless conversation. This is The Guilty Feminist, the podcast in which we explore our noble goals as 21st century feminists and the hypocrisies and insecurities which undermine them. I'm Deborah Francis-White. With me is Chaparat Kasandi, and we are talking about choosing your own adventure. Hi, this is producer Tom, just jumping in with a quick content warning. In about 10, 11 minutes' time, there's a brief mention of suicide. You'll hear it coming in. If you want to skip forward, you only need to skip forward about 30, 40 seconds. Our guest today is the star of BBC's Vandals and the BBC New Comedy Awards 2022. Please welcome to the stage and to the mic, Leila Navabi. <laughs> Hello. I'm a musical comedian. (laughs) This is embarrassing. What would possess a comedian to stand on stage and sing? Delusion. Narcissism all dressed up as self-disgust and pity She could have joined a band if she were more pretty Diversity is crucial, baby get on stage But she is not that interesting in this day and age Yes, she's brown and gay What the fuck? (laughs) Okay (laughs) Maybe that's not noteworthy no more Shappy. She. <laughs> she has got to prove her point on the dance floor. But she can't dance, and the pressure is hard to ignore. She would sell the favourite tit for half an hour on. She was a cool minority, but every dickhead and their mum is gay in 2023. What is she gonna do if she can't sell her identity wrapped up in ribbons for views? Fuck it, tomorrow she's gonna go on GB News. Fans in, <laughs> and they'll say, "Defund the BBC, lock the door, and chuck the key." What happened to comedy? I love Eamon Holmes. BT gone mad. Is she from Islamabad? Snowflake, Galahad, Betty, 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 Betty. Eamon 
Sherlock Holmes. How dare this weirdo take the piss? Captain Tom didn't die for this. I think it's been long enough now. He'd be turning in his grave. The young people just won't behave. The brown ones take over our towns. Get your pitchforks, burn the clowns. Not before the witch chant. Cause this is the future liberals. Uh, thank you so much for having me. This is my this is a dream come true for me. I said that to Deborah earlier, and she went, I "Haven't even brushed my hair. How can it be your dream come true?" And uh, fair enough. Um, I'm gonna sing a song about the most transcendent experience of my life now. I don't really know if I'm ready for this This is the moment I've been waiting for since I was six I begged my mum and my dad, they made me wait I was sad, but now that I've turned 16 I know that I'm really glad I've got you Yes, I do You put a gun to my head and bang, the old me is dead But you've come prepared with tissue It's just me and her in the shop My mum's in TK Maxx downstairs And I'm in my school uniform And she's like 23 She's got a tattoo of Zayn Malik Maybe she'll like me <laughs> We all have a type okay And mine's wearing a purple lanyard today for her name. She tells me it is Claire. And I say, oh, that's ironic. And she says she doesn't care. She mentions a ring and says that we should wait. And I get really excited. Maybe we could have a date. But she meant the earring. It had to be a stud. If you put a ring in first, you risk infection of the blood. And that's not something I want. The bar might be quite low, but I'm easily impressed. The queen of health and safety and my heart works at Claire's. Now what follows is a sort of a melodic demonstration of me getting my ears pierced, if you'll kindly oblige. Fucking hurt. <laughs> Epilogue. The piercing is finished now. And she's prepared a pack of disinfectant wipes and swabs for me to take back. A souvenir of our ill-fated short-lived love affair. But when I next wet my hole in my ear... You bet I will be thinking of Leyland and Abby, everybody, come join us. That was brilliant. Thank you so much. That's so nice. Thank you for having me. I, no, thank you for coming and being had. You did say you were very excited about doing this show. And, yeah. uh, and I immediately, I just saw myself in the mirror. I haven't even brushed my hair. And Layla had to lend me a comb. And look at the state of my hair. Do you know what's in that comb? <laughs> Not knits, but close. <laughs> <laughs> no, it's wor it worked really well. Whatever the product was in the comb, it's made my hair look It's fabulous. a concoction um, that goes back many years, Deborah. <laughs> <laughs> Well, thank you very much. And we thought, because you're recently engaged, am I allowed to say that? I am, yeah. 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 Congratulations. Um, and Shappy was do, you know, told me she was going to do stand-up about her happy ending. Well, I think it's your happy middle. It's not a happy ending. But, 
yeah. <laughs> but, well, yeah, Middleton, you know, you, you, one never knows, but I certainly... Uh, oh, we're talking about death, aren't we? Oh, my God, I'm so slow this evening. I did tell you I've had food poisoning. Yeah, no, no, but I just, think, I just think you'll know when the ending is what, what I'm saying. I see. But I know you're happy... Can, yeah, I know you're happy ever after. And we are living an ever after, I guess. I, I mean, yes, I mean, like, singlehood isn't a state that I'm looking to change. Right. It is valid and beautiful in of itself. And if it changed of its own accord, fine, but you're not looking well, to like change I'd like to have it. something to do with it. <laughs> <laughs> Sorry, I don't mean if it changed non-consensually. Oh. <laughs> I just mean if, yeah, I'm just saying, okay, I your happily you. ever after is being single. I'm not going to try and caveat that in any way, shape or form. Layla, your happily ever after is currently... Being a codependent little bitch. <laughs> I can't, I can't be single. I, can't, I, I just can't do it. I don't like it. it. Do you not like being single? You just, what, you find it what... It, 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 From the age lonely. I was able to be in a relationship, I've been in a relationship, and not with the, <laughs> with the same person. Um, just a uh, serial monogamist. I just, I think it's quite a lesbian thing. I, it, I don't know. You know, it's serial monogamy was the word that I was looking for. If if I was thinking to look for a word, yeah, I have been, <laughs> I had been a serial monogamist from I was a bit of a late starter, so twenty right up until forty nine and a half, and the only, and the only other time I was single for a length of time was when I was nine months pregnant with my daughter. So that was my only other... Sing- like, I was single the whole time. Of you my- had a companion in your belly. Exactly. Oh. oh. <laughs> I, I just, that's kind of, oh, but also, wow, you really are codependent. Uh, yeah, I can't, I can't. <laughs> I'm really bad and test terrible. So who, can you tell us anything about your relationship now? Does it look like you thought <laughs> it was going to when you were a kid? Oh, no, because it's with a woman. Um, I didn't think that was allowed when I was a child. So when you were a child, you thought... you Did not Did you just not see any role models of it? Or no. was it not allowed in your house? Or was it just... did just hadn't occurred to you that it was a thing? All of the above. Uh, it, hadn't, it hadn't occurred to me. I didn't know... Ex- oh, I always say about being gay is, like, when I was growing up, I used to think of, like, gay as, like, a thing that I knew existed, but never in my... Like, New York, right? I'd be like, oh, New York exists. I've seen it on the telly, but it doesn't... It's not real to me. It's in Wales. not for me. I'm never you know, going to get yeah. there. Yeah. And then, but also, if you can make it there, you can you make, can it, make anywhere, it anywhere. anywhere. Yeah, <laughs> yeah, yeah, yeah. Absolutely. Yeah. And the hot dogs are great. But I don't know how Plastic. that relates. Uh, I don't know how that relates. Um, <laughs> it's a big apple. I just feel if you say anything that yeah, sounds like make it sound like an innuendo, it'll work. Statue but of that, Liberty. The, yeah, the last time I was inside a woman, etc., was this when I went to the Statue, Statue of Liberty. Liberty. Yeah. I didn't know you could go inside it. Yeah, you can. You can go up the top. That's a Woody Allen joke, though, and that's so that's taken the sheen exists. off it. Yeah. <laughs> anyway, so just to, so when you were a child, what did you think it was going to look like? Uh, like what relationship? Yeah. Um, or your life? Did my you, life. Did you imagine yourself married to a man? I'm going to say something so bleak, and this is I know you've just done that whole thing about like this is a weekend and everyone wants to be happy, but I just did. I just thought I'd killed myself. Oh my god. That's really bleak, isn't it? I just did. So sorry. Uh, yeah, I didn't. Oh my god! I just, I, that's a really weird realization. But if you go like, what did you view of yourself in the future? I was like, I did not. Wow! But I'm glad I did. But do you think that's because you knew you were queer and you yeah. couldn't imagine? Yeah, but I was like, oh. well, what am I? Go- I, I couldn't. I, I was saying codependent, not at any cost, not at the cost of being with a man. Like, do you know? What I mean? <laughs> I, I'd rather, what I'm saying is, I'd rather be dead than be with a man. Which, wow! Wow, that's gay. That is gay. <laughs> that's that's the gayest I've ever heard. And I love it. I'm, I'm very... But I'm very sorry that you felt like that as a child. That's no, think, terrifying. Yeah. Not always. Not always. Like, do you know, just... But you, um, you didn't imagine yourself with a man and you didn't imagine yourself in a sort of... When you watch Disney movies, yeah. did you... Or did you know that you fancied the princess and didn't did... want to be the princess? This is what's so interesting. I never... I hated, like, princess films. I just, like, Jungle Book. Mm. I, I think I just, like, saw Mowgli and was like, that's me. Mm. <laughs> I looked like him as well, so that helps. And so do you think that the... Because the life you've made for yourself is incredible and your persona, your look, your stagecraft, your ability, you're engaged to a woman, you're like, you've created this vision wholesale out of something you couldn't even imagine as a child you didn't think was for you. Yeah. 
Uh, yeah, it's overwhelming sometimes, that, I think. Do you know what? I, I'm, I'm, I'm constantly, I'm just like literally the happiest person in the whole world. I know the world is like falling apart and it's awful, but I'm like walk around just like constantly feeling so happy because I'm like, I'm just living a little existence I didn't know was. That's great. Um, you something did you get oh like overt racism in your house uh, not, not racism <laughs> in sorry. <my> household <laughs> fucking brown bitch <laughs> uh, that was just my dad yeah, exactly. um homophobia i mean so because like in my house in my home there was never any homophobia but it just didn't still, exist. Like my brother used to joke about, yeah, we can be gay once dad dies. <laughs> but like my dad would not have been like, now that I'm older, yeah. they're like, why, well, what's the problem? And it's like, oh my God, you didn't make me feel like this at 20 or 30. And it it's it's a so that was my question. That's so interesting. Yeah, I think it wasn't like overt, overt. I think I just didn't ex- it wasn't a concept that my parents didn't didn't know any gay people. What well, uh, neither of them. My mum is was was a very strong Christian. My dad was an Iranian Muslim man. Is an Iranian Muslim man, and so it just wasn't a, something that so it was invisible. It was just invisible. Than, yeah, just, again, yeah, yeah, New York. Yeah. It just didn't. Ex- it didn't know that it existed. Sometimes Alan Carr would come on television, and I'd be like, oh, "That's an interesting person." But also, like lesbian. I didn't see. And you know, I didn't know lesbians were real. Well, I mean, they're not. Are they're they? not. They're all. Yeah, I'm a figment of your imagination. So, as a child, were you Queen Victoria? Is that what you're saying? <laughs> yeah, yeah, yeah. You didn't even think they were real. Um, I just did. I did. Yeah. Uh, no. Yeah. But there's, no, there's. I don't think there's been a lot of. Uh, I mean, you sound. You must be quite young because you said that the when you were 16, the uh, earpiece I had a tattoo of Zayn Malik. Yeah, I'm, tw- I'm 24. Right. So you're really young. So even then. So, but do when you saw what was that? That? <laughs> that seems really young to me. Um, yeah. 24. Um, but so when you were a child, was that there's still not that much lesbian representation on television, is there? There's, there was gay male representation. Yeah. Sandy Toxvig, Sorry. Claire yeah, Balding. Exactly. These all fan, like fan, again, but again, like I'd be like, oh yes. So I have to just bypass these like thirty years of my life and right. become like a stately. That's I, that's I find interesting. That sad you can... because at the age I am now, I had made the assumption that for people in their twenties. We had changed the bloody world. Oh, it does. Yeah. Feel, it's very different now. It definitely. Do you know what I mean? I think maybe it's changing. So for my for my children, like my daughter, without thinking, will say, uh, "So when I grow up, like the person I will marry, it's always the person." Mm. And that's partly because of the bubble that we are in in my friendship group and the school and the area that I'm in and all of that. Um, but I did. I went to New York for the first time in my whole life last week. Sorry, is that an, is that a euphemism? <laughs> no, I was actually New York. Oh, okay, sorry. And I'm really on. sad yeah. that I didn't know that you could actually go on to Liberty Island. I mm. thought you just had to wave at her from the boat. I, I didn't know that there was no, an no, upper yeah. tier price you could pay. Anyway, that's a euphemism. Yes. Yeah. So I've got a cousin that lives in Brooklyn, and she's half Iranian. And we've become. She came to Edinburgh Festival last year, and we became really good friends. I'm, gorgeous thing in my life and she's 30 and when I was in New York I said to her so what made you come and find us because we'd never you know she lived in America Um, and she goes well I came out to my parents and they told me I was disgusting so I wanted to um, meet some family that didn't think I was disgusting and my my heart broke because that's my uncle and I thought how hard is it to let your kid feel they're perfect inside out, upside down and back to front? And then I, then I started wondering, I wonder how I'm fucking my kids up. I won't know now until they're much older. That's so interesting, isn't Mom, it? I want to be straight. No. <laughs> yeah, no, absolutely not. I think that's really interesting. I think, I think my parents, like, maybe I'm the bigoted one because I just feel like they were brainwashed. As I feel. Do you know what I mean? Like to, to, to be... I think there has to be a very powerful mechanism within someone's upbringing to make them not feel instantly accepting of their child, however they present. Something so powerful that is, do you know what I mean? That well, it, of course it took them time. They they love me now. They're, I'm I'm wondering. As a <laughs> parent, always did. Just, I'm wondering. I think if there is an element of safety and security, like the way they see the world is a world where if you're gay, it's not going to be as kind to your child so they're very fearful of homophobia and so they wish you were 
you would fit this particular yeah. box mm. instead of thinking like, well, we all have to fight now to make the world. Yeah, Hannah Gadsby says, I think, in Annette that um, she, her mother said, um, I knew that the world wasn't going to change for you, so I tried to change you for the world mm. because you can see that this is not... You know, but, but a lot of people have been, yeah, as you say, brainwashed into thinking, oh, yuck, you know, no, 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 that's awful or that's... Mm. And, and I think to, to be able to break out of that and say, even if you stop loving me, I'm going to be me, is such a bold, bold decision, especially if you have parents who... Uh, have an emotional hold over you, as many people you do. You know, when you're a child, of course they do. And whether they wield that, uh, how, how to the extent that they wield that is is a thing. You know, I did a little exercise for myself, like a little challenge to myself, to think of all the lives that I could have had, but to kind of visualise I was in them for this show. And I imagined myself as a Jehovah's Witness um, married to a circuit overseer, which I think I probably would have. I, I, I wherever I a circuit overseer is an elder. Uh, an elder is the you know the body of men who run each congregation. A circuit overseer, they and, and his wife, always his, um, they go around to, from congregation to congregation and check in that everything's being done right. And when the circuit overseer comes to visit, everyone wants to have the dinner, and they're very fancy. And I imagined myself on the road as a circuit overseer's wife, and I just made myself sit in it because that could have happened to me. And if I hadn't got out, and I just uh, sat myself in it and imagined the feelings I would have and. Uh, I, most of the feeling was the biggest feeling I had was run, 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 leave, run. Tra you're trapped. You're trapped. And I felt like I couldn't breathe, feeling that life. And then I imagined I was a parallel life. I had four children, and a sort of big, ha you know, like a house somewhere. Not obviously in London because who can have a big house in London? But I don't know. I live somewhere else. I don't Wales, know. probably. Yeah. <laughs> um, and and lots of kids running in and out, and you know. I don't know, like a, a whole other life. And I imagined that life and I felt a sort of, I think in that parallel life, I, 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 I do feel a joy from the noise and the, ha the sort of lots of, you know, lots of kids. But I also feel an overwhelm and I felt a massive overwhelm. And then I imagined having a baby when I tried to have one in 2011. So that would be, child would be about 12 now. And I imagined that. And I imagined this great feeling of love, but I also imagined this feeling of great fear for the child. And so I made myself sit in those things because it's really easy to, I think, fantasise about another life in which everything's wonderful. Yeah. And you don't... No, no one's life is wonderful. All the time. Everyone has dissatisfaction, fear of the... What, you know, all my friends who are parents, not all, many of my friends who are parents do go, oh, but if I had, didn't have the kids, I could have done this and this and this. And they have that other life going on in a parallel track every now and again when things are too much, they think... Well, if I hadn't done this, I could be doing that. And lots of my friends who are single think, but if I had a partner, but my friends who have a partner think, but if I were single. And I think it's really good to just meditate in the other space and find what's joyful there and what problems you have there and then meditate in your own space and do the same thing. Yeah, that's, that's brilliant, yeah. <laughs> and you, you do all this thinking without ADHD drugs. <laughs> that's right. Yeah, I have to keep myself... I have to come back to it, because obviously my brain goes... Da, 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 da. I was I, redecorating my wardrobe doors while you were talking. <laughs> <laughs> um, I did a bit of that too. I'm, I'm doing new paint colours. Um, but I... Yeah, I do think it's important to do that, because we imagine if that TV show had gone... Well, you know, you, we have, we've both had TV pilots and things like that. You think, but if that had gone... Now I'd be here. But no, you wouldn't be happier... You'd be happy in different ways and you'd be unhappy in different ways. That's all That's it would so ever true. be. You know, and also, ha those things are all external things. That's not what happiness is. That is that's, that's what I've learned and that's what I'm learning. It's all about connection. Connection with people, connection with your world and jobs and all of that doesn't give you that connection. But for what it's worth, right? I remember I did stand up for the first time when I was like 23 and you say you're 24. I could not. You have... say you're 24. <laughs> I'll get my driving license out if you're like. Yeah. <laughs> if if <laughs> Layla is your real name. Yeah. <laughs> you are half Iranian after all. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> you make up all sorts of shit. Um, yeah, I could not. Cause it, so my if only would have been if my ADHD had been discovered earlier mm. and I would have got my shit together. And so I wouldn't have spent my 20s on the comedy circuit in a fuel of. Um, in, in a fog of uh, booze and 
not being able to be present. And instead, I would have got help with, with ADHD. I would have done stand-up comedy, and I would have done it with much more focus, and I would have decided it's all a load of bullshit and it only feeds my ego, and by now I would have just been, like, head of the BBC. <laughs> that's, that's but I haven't saying. you now got... Didn't you go and do a Masters and... Aren't you now a qualified therapist? Oh, gosh, I only started in um, October. Um, oh, I'm, you're starting? Yeah, you're, I, you're starting? Yes, now. I'm in my first year as a psychotherapist. Doing my wow. master, and thank that's you. So cool. And that's something that, like, it's my little, it's my present to myself because my education um, really suffered because of ADHD, and it shouldn't have done. Because I'm a geek, mm. I'm a geek at heart, and all my friends are super clever. I'm always been friends with like the clever kids, people with PhDs. If we got to know each other, you would be my friend. I would make you my friend. If you haven't got a PhD, we'll have an interview. Um, <laughs> So I am now being a geek, and it's really interesting doing my class, and I've already attached myself to the people who clearly know when essays are due, what has to be put in. <laughs> One of my classmates is coming around tomorrow to help me learn how to use Moodle or whatever it is. Oh, my God, fuck Moodle. Fuck and Moodle. I didn't even go to university and I know what Moodle is. Yeah, and I just... Uh, it's a joy. And the thing about the psychotherapy and the happiness it brings me is because I finally understood that thing that people have always said to me all my life. You're not going to find it in a relationship. You're not going to find it in a job. You're not going to find it in money, anything. You're going to find it with connection and being at one with yourself. And it is an actual joy. And all this year, I've been deliriously happy. But then just lately, um, I haven't been. I think all of us haven't been. Yeah, yeah. And I thought, fuck, I'm ah, I'm still able to feel feelings, which was a relief, I'll be mm. honest with you, because yeah. I, I, so, I had so much therapy that I really worried that I'd gone from being an empath to a sociopath. <laughs> <laughs> That's, I love that. So it's just like, oh, fuck, I really can't deal with this, and I have to deal with it, and I'm dealing with it, but I'm, mm. I'm better at dealing with my, with, with my emotions because I can indulge myself in them and, and sit with them and not shun them. Mm. And I'm hungry now. I just felt that I should say that out loud, that I feel hunger, because I've had so much psychotherapy. Because I'm half a rain and you're like, maybe she'll make me some good food. Yeah. <laughs> yeah, do yeah, you, yeah. Do I you just... feel that feminism has helped you depart from that picture of, you know, oh, I've got to be married or I've got to have kids or I've got to have, you know, I've got to be in a heterosexual relationship or whatever. The, the things that we were taught as kids or we just saw modelled yeah. the whole time. Do you think feminism has helped you redraw your own picture? Well, I... I feel that I came to feminism quite late in life, consciously, because although my dad, my dad is a feminist, he never put any of those pressures on me, do what you like, you know, he was far uh, more um, liberal about me having boyfriends than my mum was, and he's a big feminist, always having his friend round, friends around talking about feminism. Um, I don't know what my mum's views were on feminism because she was always in the kitchen, cooking. <laughs> for him and his other male friends who were talking friends. about feminism. <laughs> yeah. Brilliant. So I saw that happening as a child. I'm mm. like, mm, not really seeing these two, ma you know, th these two connected. And then I, I don't know who did this quote. I have investigated, but someone said, I have no time for feminism. I'm too busy being black. <laughs> right. Mm. And I just remember when I started stand-up comedy and everyone started talking about oh, women in comedy, is it hard for women in comedy? And all I thought was, I'm like the, one of the only brown people yeah, I yeah, know yeah, doing yeah. it. And you took bloody years to be born, Leila. I know. I've been that's... waiting and waiting for a brown person, ideally with an Iranian connection. No, but, then, a sudden... yes, no, but I didn't have to wait for that because there was you. Do you understand this? I have fucking... Oh. No, I'm not joking. Do you know how big of a deal this is to me right now? Oh. I'm sorry, I'm not joking. I actually forgot, it was me, I like watch, sitting, watching live at the Apollo and being like, who the fuck is that? And my dad being like, oh, well, her dad. And I'm like, no, 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 no I don't care about her, who's that? Uh, <laughs> Honestly. It's... Well, her dad's in the kitchen talking about yeah, feminism. Of course. <laughs> <laughs> well, that, do you know what? That is really beautiful to hear because Iranians all, Iranians all know my dad. My dad's a very famous poet. And... Um, and it's interesting because when I was on live at the Apollo, freaking out going, oh, my God, everyone's in watches and I'm on telly. The last thing on my mind was, like, other people will see this because that's not what you're doing this for. This job is not a job to, to, <laughs> to help others. But when you hear it on the other side, it, that really, honestly, I nearly cried. That really touched me. 
because I felt that when I saw um, Omid Jalili, I could not believe an Iranian person was not in the Iranian community doing the arts. Yeah. They'd gone out into the mainstream doing yeah. the arts, and he did a show called Short Fat Kebab Shapona's Son. And I wrote to him, it was back in the days where I had to hand deliver the letter to the lyric in, um, sorry, the, yeah, the Lyric Hammersmith. No, the, the Riverside Studios in Hammersmith. Um, and then I left my phone number and, and I'd written, I, I was a short fat kebab shop owner's daughter. And he rang me and he just helped me out. And he, he didn't help me out. He just yeah. like gave me the time of day. That was help enough. And yeah, so feminism for me came later when I realized that my life is just naturally... Like, I'm raising children by myself. My mum and dad were so big on me earning my own money. So big on earning money for myself. Because they'd both say, my mum would say to me, because that means you have an escape. (laughs) (laughs) And I was like, one that you didn't, mother, I hear you. And whereas my father would say, that would mean you never feel like you owe anyone anything. Mm. And all of that. So I did, but not consciously. And then I had children, mm. and then I realized, especially with my boy, how important it was. Don't ever think that the sons of single mothers are more naturally going to be <laughs> feminist. It's really interesting. Both of the fathers of my children are only um, sons, only children. And oh, let's not talk about that. Sorry, I just realized I might. No, listen, my ex-husband is an incredible father. He would do anything for our son every other weekend. No, I'm kidding. I'm kidding. No, he's, he is an amazing father. But it's, it is interesting how that doesn't mean that they're going to be more understanding mm-hmm. of you having a career and needing, you know, a, a, a co-toilet cleaner. Mm. Yeah. All of that stuff still lands on you as the woman. Mm. And we were talking about today about how if a man goes away, uh, someone will say, oh, yeah, Bob's away this week, to a mother. And, oh, he's on on business. No, no comment we made. But if a woman goes away and the man's babysitting his own children, quote, unquote, if man's, it'll be like, oh, how are you coping? Uh, do you and need help? Just, Shall I come over? Yeah. No one ever says to a woman whose um, husband is away, oh, you're flying solo, are you? Or feeling like that's the, the school's conversation. It's never the dads, it's the mums. So that one we... solved this and it is lesbianism. I'm really sorry to say it's <laughs> lesbianism. Yeah. Oh, thank I can't, I, honestly, this is why, uh, this is why I'm like, I love to be in a team, I love to do it. Because I'm like, constantly, like if, if one of us is away, do you know what I mean? Like, I yeah. feel like there's always another. So that we're both competent. <laughs> yes, the Maybe assumption I'm just a is. I don't know. No, I think the assumption is that women are competent at domestic things, which is totally not right mm. because I'm not. I'm, I'm the not, most no. incompetent at domestic. Things. I will tell you, it was after my husband left me when I realised how much of the washing he did. He did do all of the washing, really? but in terms of um, competent, I think men are so competent, but we infantilize. And I say we, we infantilize them. Um. I'm getting winded up signals from the patriarchy in the corner. <laughs> so, poor Tom, who's the wonderful producer, and he has to get out of the theatre because the people who work at the theatre would like to go home. Um, Leila, did, is there anything you came to say you didn't get to say? Please come and see me at this theatre in a week and a half. A week and a half? 14th to the 8th of November. I need to sell some tickets because okay. it's a struggle. 14th to the 18th. Which room are you in? Uh, upstairs. You're upstairs. Okay, 14th to the 18th. 18th of November. There's four shows. So could you all come and bring a couple Eight, of friends? Five shows. Oh, five 14, shows. 15, 16, 17, 18, yeah. 14, 15, 16, 17, 18. It sounds like four shows, 14th to the 18th. Yeah, it me. does, but it's not. No, it's a, it's a whole fifth <laughs> show. All right, so please come and see Leila's show. It's called Composition. Mm -hmm. Um, Please come and see it. It's on here, 14th to the 18th. Shappi, anything to plug or anything you'd like Um, to say? I have a book out called Scatterbrain about adult ADHD um, and you should buy it and read it on your way to see Leila Navabi at the Soho Theatre. Excellent. A big round of applause for Shaparat Kosandi. Leila Navabi and everybody here at uh, the Soho Theatre and your good selves are coming especially those of you who are doing PhDs already have them 
thank you so much. You've been an incredible audience. I've been Deborah Francis White. We've been the Guilty Feminists. Good night. You have been listening to the Guilty Feminists with me, Deborah Francis White, guest co-host Shafra Akasani, and our very special guest, Leila Nababi. The recording engineer was Grundy Lazimbra. Music was by Mark Hodge. The producer was Tom Selinski for the Spontaneity Shop. Thanks to Rachel Kraftman, Gina Dicio, Zainab Mohammed, and everyone at the Soho Theatre as well as all of you for listening. For more information about this and other episodes, visit guiltyfeminist.com. Let's play I'm a Feminist But. Um, now, if you don't know this, you've not been to the show before or heard it, this is like feminist confessional. Is anyone, anyone Catholic? Give us a cheer. <laughs> that was a guilty cheer. It's like, um, no Catholics in. Anyone, has anyone been to Catholic confessional? Give us a cheer. Yeah, there you are. Why were you not cheering before? You just, you didn't want to be outed. You, you were worried you were going to have your head chopped off. That it was a Protestant plot. What was that? Shame. What? Shame. 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 Just general shame. Uh, well, this is like confessional, except the priest is you. Um, uh, all right. So uh, it always starts with I'm a feminist, but so I'm going to do one. Oh, I've just killed it. Okay. Um, the Guilty Feminist is provided exclusively from Acast. Find it wherever you get your podcasts.